Tim Ballard. He's the uh, DHS agent, former DHS agent, whose uh, story and life's work was memorialized in the sound, in the uh, movie Sound of Freedom. I always want to say Cry Freedom. Yeah, it's Sound of Freedom. Yeah, Cry Freedom was the Stephen Biko movie. Denzel Washington, Stephen Biko. Remember Kevin Klein as the journalist? Oh, yeah, I saw that movie. You didn't see Cry Freedom either? You didn't I see saw Coming sound to America? You didn't see Cry Freedom? No, but I did see Sound of Freedom, well, that's a and I loved it. Mm. I mean, it was painful to watch, but it, it really woke you up. And I've never left a movie theater wanting to do something to help a problem more than that movie. Well, Cry Freedom and Sound of Freedom have something in common. They're essentially, they, they essentially both document man's inhumanity to man. Um, although Peter Gabriel didn't do a song for Sound of Freedom. That would have been helpful. Uh, anyway, uh, here's what Tim Ballard had to say. Remember how the left was so outraged about, uh, quote-unquote, children in cages at the border. Oh, yeah. AOC was there, and she was crying, her head in her hands. Um, oh, how, about, the kids. how about 85,000 children, minors, unaccompanied, came here and have disappeared? How many? And the federal government doesn't know where 85,000 kids are. <gasps> and they, they're more likely than not, some of them at least are in the hands of human traffickers and are being grotesquely exploited. That was the testimony of Tim Ballard in support of the SECURE Act, which would compel the Department of Homeland Security to investigate and document where these 85,000 children went. The government is so interested in protecting children. Right. Traffickers use our southern border to bring slaves into our country for the sex industry because the United States is one of the highest consumers in child sex abuse material in the world. Our federal agents who work at the southern border are women and men of the highest integrity and dedication. Yet despite the hard work and success agents on the ground, one thing has become vividly clear. Poor U.S. border security and broken U.S. policy are feeding the growth of human trafficking in the United States. One way this is seen is the absence of physical barriers on our border. I have personally seen how ports of entry were responsible for helping rescue a child, catch a sexual predator, and start a chain of events that rescued multiple children from his abuse. On the other hand, I've spoken with survivors who were trafficked by cartels, taking advantage of the miles of unprotected U.S. border. In one case in particular, a young woman was brought across the border at an area where no barriers or protections existed. Once in the U.S., she was sold and raped for money up to 30 to 40 times a day for five years before eventually escaping herself. She shared with me the tragic conclusion that had her captors been forced to attempt a crossing into our country at the port of entry, just like the little boy you saw in the film, that she would have had a better chance of being rescued. But the success we've seen in interdiction in interdicting human trafficking at points of entry means nothing if our immigration policies allow traffickers to flaunt legal loopholes. Recently, members of Congress sounded the alarm on information that the government has lost track of 85,000 minors that crossed the border unaccompanied. And the New York Times reported that the Department of Health and Human Services has lost contact with thousands of children who were released to sponsors that are now, and these children are now uh, feared of being risk for ex exploitation. How's that grab you? Another aspect of the open borders policy of this administration and of the Democrat Socialist Party writ large. And their reaction to the uh, migrant issues that have um, vi been visited upon major metropolises now, like Chicago and New York. Their reaction to that, their reaction to what uh, Tim Ballard is testifying about. I think it's nicely encapsulated by Dan Goldman, ironically, a Democrat socialist from New York. He was asked about uh, all of Eric Adams' caterwauling and what's happening in New York City. Eric Adams saying they're going to destroy the city. That's what he said. Do you not think that the migrant crisis or the southern border situation is at all a security threat to New Yorkers? I, I don't think it's any more of a security threat to New Yorkers uh, than domestic violent extremism <laughs> or other threat. It's no more of a threat to New Yorkers than anybody who attended uh, Trump's speech on January 6th. That's as much of a threat to New Yorkers as 
uh, open borders. Okay. John Nolte is a Breitbart News senior writer. He's got a new book out, new novel. He writes fiction, too. Writes nonfiction for Breitbart, but he writes fiction in his free time. And the new novel is called Borrowed Time. We'll talk to him about that a bit as well. John, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Always good to talk to you. So, um, you know, the from Tim Ballard to Eric Adams, uh, it's uh, interesting, the hue and cry about uh, open borders uh, uh, across the political spectrum. Yeah, there's, I mean, Eric Adams is, when he took office, he welcomed illegal immigrants. This is a sanctuary city. So the virtue signaling now has met reality. And it is going to destroy a city. We're reading over and over again about all these parts of the city that are being destroyed because we're importing the third world. We're not vetting anyone. We're putting them up at these hotels and airports and motels and abandoned buildings and gyms. And they're destroying the city because they, you know, these are not people who have been vetted. These are not people who came here to aspire or who love the, the, the idea of America. Uh, they just came here to get free stuff, and they know Biden's going to give them free stuff. And this is how the great replacement theory works. This, these are the people that you can, that the Democrats can get to, get to vote for them, and that's what they want to do. They want to destroy Texas, turn it blue. They want to destroy Oklahoma, turn it blue. And this is the they've already done it to Arizona. The Arizona is almost blue now. New Mexico. So this California's lost. California, when I was growing up, was a Republican state. Then they let in all these illegal immigrants now it's as left-wing as it gets and that's the goal that's that's all that's going on here and they don't care about the kids they don't to them morality is the goal and whatever it takes to achieve that goal few thousand hundred thousand kids get lost or raped 30 times a day to them that's just the price people have to pay for their utopia dan henninger had a good piece about this in part and he sort of um, encapsulated like a, a an overarching theme for this coming election, arguing against Republicans who think that uh, you just have to talk dollars and cents. It's just binomics. You have to stay away from the culture because you don't want to be forced to talk about abortion and gender ideology. He uh, argues that the larger play is a personal responsibility one, and that includes uh, – those cultural issues. It includes the impact of marijuana legalization and decriminalization. It includes the uh, decriminalization of shoplifting in major cities. It includes the open border policy. It includes the college, the forgiveness of, or the socialization of student debt gambit of the Biden administration. It includes Democrats' op uh, opposition to work requirements for welfare. Um, the, um, the whole idea that uh, voters 35 to 64 are watching the um, fabric of society frayed purposely by the left and saying, this is not what I want to leave for my, this is not what I'm teaching my kids, and it's not what I want to leave for my kids. The personal responsibility uh, election, if you will, the personal responsibility litmus test for this election. What do you think of that uh, positioning? Yeah, it's, I think it's, I think we tried to make that argument in 2022 in the midterms. And I've always had faith in the American voter. And I was certain the Democrats were going to be humiliated and they weren't. And I don't know what to think of it anymore. I don't know what the approach is. The only thing that I find heartening right now is that if you look at the real clear politics poll of average polls, Trump is beating Biden nationally. And in the 2020 election, Trump never topped Biden and by in this poll of polls throughout the whole cycle, never topped Biden. And in fact, Biden was always ahead by at least four points. So maybe something's changing and maybe all of these things are coming to the forefront and people are seeing the videos of the mass looting. And they're seeing the videos of all these people pouring across the border, the border. And they're seeing and now and now because Greg Abbott, the Texas governor, is a genius. Democrats are actually having to, 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 to know what sanctuary means as, as these illegals are funneled into these left-wing cities, which is where they belong. 
So maybe this is enough. I don't, I don't know. But after the, after the midterms, um, which should have been a blowout, I just don't know where the voters at and I don't know how to reach them because mutilating kids uh, at the altar of trans gods, that should have been enough in my book. And it just wasn't. Speaking of books, uh, your new book, Borrowed Time. Uh, why should Democrats read a book written by a Breitbart guy? <laughs> <laughs> what a great question. You know, one of the things I've been doing at Breitbart for the last almost 20 years now is I've been railing against Hollywood because Hollywood is destroying entertainment by turning entertainment into propaganda. And when a movie works, it works. It takes you away. You escape into it. And if you want to destroy that that beautiful gift that movies give us, you interject lectures and you interject propaganda and rhetoric. So Borrowed Time is my book. It obviously reflects my worldview. But one of the things I worked very hard at was not doing that. Ask anyone that I asked to read it early that I said, can you look at this for me and tell me if I have something? I told them the same thing. And I gave it to left-wing people too, because I have left-wing friends. I said, is it a page turner? Did you want to know what happened next? Did it, did it capture you? Did you find it engrossing? And I said, if you, if you get to a point where you don't want to read it anymore, where it becomes homework, put it down and tell me what page you didn't want to read it anymore. So that was my primary goal was to just write an engrossing story that will just take people away and let them escape for a little bit. That doesn't mean it's not about things, you know, the great escapist movies out there, you know, Shawshank Redemption, Treasure Sierra Madre that you get lost. They're about something important, but they don't beat you over the head. They don't break the storytelling spell. And that was my primary goal. Yeah, no. That, and there's a, as I, I read the uh, synopsis, there's a supernatural element to it as well. Right. Which is which, which yeah. is kind of timely given, well, I mean, I'll just disclose this piece of it, which is kind of timely given the um, uh, the futurists on staff at places like Google uh, that are trying to figure out how to put their brains <laughs> on titanium bodies and live forever. Yeah, my protagonist is immortal. He's been alive for thousands of years. Oh, wow. But what, what made him different, at least from what I've seen in pop culture, there might be someone who's done this, is that he's just a regular guy. He's not a vampire. He's not a superhero. He's not part of some cosmic uh, thing like the, like the Highlander series. He's just a regular guy. He doesn't even know why he's immortal. And he's trying to navigate our society, modern society. He's trying to stay hidden. But, you know, the way our society is encroaching on all of us, digital money, social security numbers, everybody carries a phone, our phones track us. He finds this very difficult. And what he ends up doing uh, to protect his family, to provide for his family, is he sells his life. That's his renewable resource. So he sells his life to rich people and it allows them to kill him however they want because he always comes back. And the story kind of kicks off when he sells his life to the wrong people. Interesting. No, I, I like it. I, I, you know, and I see it. You're right yeah. about this, too. Um, I was just having this conversation with Andrew Clavin, um, who has been railing about conservatives building their own uh, art house castles, if you will, for 20 years, the need to be storytellers like this. You have uh, themes that reflect values and worldviews, as you were just saying, but you tell them in story format the way that the great art uh, does, the way that Flannery O'Connor did. Um, and um, so we definitely need more hands on deck on that score. And you're one of them. John Nolte is the senior writer for Breitbart News. And the new book he was just describing fiction borrowed time borrowed time by john nolte pick it up john thanks so much for joining us appreciate it thank you both very much have a good weekend thanks you too and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line the stories you need to know to start your day this is chicago's morning answer on am 560 the answer are you turning 65 and thinking about medicare or are you over 65 and haven't enrolled yet because you still have coverage at work 